was uh, hoping to talk to you about was the use of patterns in conflict mapping. And we have broached this topic yesterday in, in a number of abundant ways. And I think that the um, chance to bring some of these ideas together, both mine and um, ideas that I think you'll see you have reflected in this, um, is probably a good way to start today and will lead us into the next uh, phase of our roundtables. Uh, a number of you may be familiar with the World Disasters Report, and I bring it here just to show that in uh, 2005, which is their, the publication that's an annual one, they focus on information and disasters. And this quote, which may be too small for some of you to read, it is the flow of information throughout the disaster cycle is crucial for effective humanitarian operations. This year's report with illuminating examples from uh, before, during, and after emergencies will be welcomed by practitioners and policymakers. And then if you see the bullets here, these are the sorts of things we're talking about in terms of information, data or dialogue, hurricane early warning in the Caribbean, uh, locusts in West Africa, early warning and response, but a late response, uh, information from the black hole in Aceh, remember this is 2005, sharing information for tsunami recovery in South Asia, humanitarian media coverage in the digital age, radio in Afghanistan, um, challenging perceptions, changing behavior, and disaster data, key databases, trends, and statistics. This is uh, essentially a document that reflects a stage of readiness on the humanitarian community already now four years ago for the sorts of information that will be generated by the kinds of tools and methodologies we've been talking about. N my hope in this talk is to um, explore with you the ways in which um, analytic observers make sense of our world. And the uh, analytic is underscored as well as observers in my thought. Uh, we are, we are um, not just watching something, we're observing. Everything we see, we are sifting to find meaning. And most of our processes are inductive. That is, we look at the outside and we bring in what we see and we map it, almost literally in terms of brain patterns, against what our previous experience is. And we say, does this make sense? Is this a little bit off? And our mode of going back and forth between the observed and our inner sense of what is expected is the primary way in which human beings interact with our worlds. This is also the primary ways that um, animals do. And um, the premise here is that visualization accelerates our capacity to engage with large data sets, that we make sense out of a great mass of information if we can see it in a form that is visually appreciable. Now, if we are speaking about the analytic potential of patterns uh, in the context of crises, um, I submit that our major um, uh, path forward should be to think about patterns as ways of looking at risk of one occurring or the possibility of one intensifying. There might be a third bullet here, which is the confirmation of something that has occurred. <clears throat> so the point here that I uh, begin with is our apprehension in a visual mode is that the way that we use patterns is that we're thinking in terms of visual adjacencies, overlaps, and uh, comparing it to more complex experience-based relationships that we have already embedded in our memory. And this way of identifying a pattern is uh, in itself quite complicated. And then what is even more interesting and complicated is the way we begin to say, yes, that's a pattern we're going to use. And how do we use it? We recognize it in another set of data. Now this sounds quite um, subjective. Uh, in fact, all philosophical assessments of epistemology and how we know uh, come down to the fact that um, it is all very subjective. Uh, there are very few philosophers who really believe that outside there is a truth. Most say all we do is gain um, more understanding and certainty about approaches to truth. And here, one of the ways we do it is through an iterative pattern of forming patterns and then recognizing them as they occur. Now, this is deliberately without a um, header here. Uh, anybody know what this might be? There we go, John Snow. And um, a point I'm making is that the use of patterns and pattern recognition is something that has advanced remarkably since World War II through the applied social sciences. But that you can find uh, marvelous um, approaches to this whole concept in the mid um, 19th century. John Snow was one of them. Um, Ignaz Semmelweis is the other. 
Uh, and what they basically have done is see a phenomenon, map it, find out where their occurrences of interest occur on the map, and then, and then go into the situation and inquire about those occurrences. It's not just the visual part. It's information that is derived and directed from the mapping. And then what they do is they go deeper and begin to see what actually took place. So this is an inside shot of this. This is Broad Street, which is now called Broadwick in Soho in London. And uh, this is the pump uh, here, the Broad Street pump. And these are the enumerations of deaths by household. And he got over to some of these other places, for instance, this one. See, this is in the distribution of where the pump is. But some of these that are farther away but seem numerous, because he thought it would, as he was looking at it, he thought that most of the deaths should be over here. It turns out over here, some of these people actually were closer to another pump that was here, but they went to this one for a bunch of neighborhood reasons. And so the, it was a, the link to the location of where these deaths occurred, but also the fact that they, when he went and looked at aberrancies, he actually found out, in terms of truth-telling, that in fact they were using the pump, even though it seemed didn't make sense from what his interpretation was already landing on for this drawings. And this represented a lot of work that involved um, still going in the human capacity for judgment and interrogation of the ground. Uh, but behind this, behind this whole notion, was the fact that Jon Snow was already at odds with the prevailing notion of what caused disease in the mid-19th century. He thought that the whole notion of miasma, that it was in evil uh, odors and, and currents in the air, was not the way that disease spread. He did not know about the germ theory, but he did have the sense that the water, that these were waterborne diseases, and that was why he went to the pump. And this gets to another aspect I'd like to underscore in terms of pattern and pattern recognition. Just because things are adjacent and just because things occur in the same time frame does not me mean that they have any profound relationship in terms of cause, effect, ramification, reverberation. One has to work hard and this is an intellectual process that also can be a community intellectual process, at underscoring and undermining this, these apparent relations by saying, what is actually going on? What is the mechanism that links this piece of data to that piece of data? And the reason I bring up his um, contention about the miasma point is that uh, this would not have been something he drew or looked at, um, <laughs> because he would have thought with the air currents, he would have been looking at air, downwind, upwind, et cetera. He was looking at the water. And so he had a notion of what caused this disease, and this was how he established it. So the approach to um, pattern recognition, um, it, in terms of finding patterns, recognizing them, and, and, and attaching meaning to them, um, I'm proposing comes through the empirical social sciences. And this is a field that a number of you grew up in, preliminarily trained in, are familiar with, uh, or you work alongside people who've been trained in these areas. And from the standpoint of the high technology that some of you are very adapted to, uh, the way in which these technologies are gonna be placed and positioned to make sense of our world is through an incorporation with some of the findings from the empirical social sciences, which um, I'm casting a broad net here. We're speaking of demography, epistemology, mapping techniques. It involves normative and analytic frameworks from medicine, law, social psychology, human rights. Uh, it, as I mentioned earlier, it has this point of rapid growth of the applied social sciences during World II. The Allies in particular were combing the world for experts that could help them understand human behavior. Uh, and then there's a very, very uh, broad and evolving uh, process of methodology improvement, qualitative and quantitative methods. And then, this is where I was getting at. It relies on our standard and involving techniques of inference. 